Welcome to Selected Techniques for Model Assessment. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Today we'll explore Pearson's goodness of fit test for evaluating a discrete distribution's ability to model a sample of data and normal correlation analysis for evaluating the degree to which features in a data set appear to be linearly correlated. We will illustrate both techniques with examples. We'll begin by defining Pearson's goodness of fit test, which is closely tied to the chi-squared distribution. Suppose a process can result in n distinct outcomes, and we have a model for the expected frequency, or e sub i, with i ranging from 1 through n, of observing each of these outcomes were we to conduct the process a total of capital N times. Suppose further that we actually conduct the process repeatedly and observe the actual number of times, O sub i, each of the possible outcomes occurs among our n trials. As long as we ensure that we conduct enough trials that each frequency exceeds 5, then the following test statistic, chi squared is equal to the sum over the square of the differences between e sub i and o sub i divided by e sub i follows a chi squared distribution with nu equal lowercase n minus k degrees of freedom where k is the number of parameters in the model that are dependent upon or estimated by the observed data. Since chi squared is a measure of the difference between predicted or e sub i and observed or o sub i frequencies we should expect chi-squared to be small in circumstances where the model fits the data well enough and large in situations where it doesn't. A good null hypothesis for testing goodness of fit with the chi-squared distribution is h sub 0. The model, or expected observations, accurately describes the actual observations. Thus, rejecting the null hypothesis means the appearance of abnormally large test statistic values, abnormally large values of chi-squared, in comparison to what the chi-squared distribution suggests we should see. We'll illustrate the goodness of fit test with an example. A game designer believes that a game he is developing will be won approximately 17% of the time. In order to test this belief, he concludes that a binomial distribution with n equals 30 and p equals 0 0.17 should predict the probability that anyone who plays the game n successive times will win during any x of the 30 plays. The designer releases the game to 50 people and asks each of them to play 30 times and record the number of times they won. Then he tabulates the resulting data into the following table. So what we're looking at is a frequency table. The left column represents the number of values that x could possibly take on, ranging anywhere from 0 to a total of 30, because each person plays the game for 30 times, and x represents the number of those times that they win the game. And then, out of the 50 people who actually played the game for 30 times each, the right column represents the number of times one of those people won the game a given number of x times. So we can see that two people never won the game at all out of the 30 times that they played. Nobody won the game once, three people won the game two times, six people won the game three times, and so on. That's how our frequency table summarizes the data that the game designer collected from his volunteers. The game designer uses this data to construct empirical frequencies, O of x, for each value of x ranging from 0 to 30. These are the observed number of times a particular value of x appeared in our data set that's summarized in the right-hand column of the table. Then the game designer computes the theoretical frequencies, or the expected frequencies, of observing each value of x by scaling the binomial distribution by the number of observations. So essentially we're taking the binomial distribution and multiplying it by 50 observations to get the expected value for each possible value of x. 
So we're looking at that bar graph now. And the blue bars represent the expected or theoretical frequencies that we've computed by multiplying the binomial distribution by 50 observations. And the orange bars represent the empirical frequencies that came from counting the number of times people won the game a given number of times out of 30. We can see that the agreement looks reasonably good. Well, that agreement looks good in a qualitative sense, but in order to quantify the level of agreement, the designer performs a chi-squared goodness of fit test. To do so, he pools both his observed and experimental data into enough bins that are chosen to ensure that there are at least five observations from the data set belonging to each bin. If we were to go back and look at our frequency table, we would see that for x equals zero, there were not five observations. So we could not use x equals zero as an individual bin. The same would be true for x equals one and x equals two. Also be true individually for x equals seven, x equals eight, x equals nine, x equals 10, and so on up to 30. That's because these values of x are representing where the tails of the distribution are. We're just not seeing our observations in those tails that frequently. So in order to make sure that all of our bins have at least five observations in them, we merge those bins together into intervals that contain very few observations individually. So x equals zero through two becomes a macro bin that has five observations in it. x equals seven through 30 also becomes a macro bin and that has seven observations in it. The remaining individual values of x, x equals three, four, five, and six, those had enough observations in our data set to push them above five. So we leave them as individual bins just on their own. So the table that we're looking at summarizes those number of observations per bin together with what the binomial distribution predicts that we should expect to see. We're going, so those are our O and E values, and we're going to use those to compute a chi-squared test statistic. We do that by taking each observed frequency, subtracting it from the corresponding expected frequency from our table, squaring that, and then divide it by the corresponding expected frequency again. Then we sum up those results, and that gives us our chi-squared test statistic in this case, it sums to 4.8945. The designer needs to compare this statistic to an appropriate chi-square distribution. While there are six possible bins of frequencies being compared, there aren't actually six degrees of freedom. The fact that we know that there were a total of 50 observations made to form our data set means that once we know the frequencies of any five bins, the frequency of the sixth bin may be computed precisely. This causes us to lose one degree of freedom. Therefore, the designer compares his test statistic to the chi-squared distribution with nu equal five degrees of freedom. The density function for this distribution is depicted on the next screen. Recall that the chi-squared test statistic is a measure of how severe the error is between the observed and expected frequencies. If that error is too great, the statistic would fall on the upper tail of the distribution, pictured above. If it was too small, indicating an improbably good fit, we would find it down closer to zero, where the lower tail ordinarily would be. Take a moment to notice where our value of the chi-squared test statistic, or 4.8945, falls relative to the graph of our chi-squared distribution. The value of chi-squared equals 4.8945 falls much closer to the mode of the distribution than either of the tails. The p-value for this statistic is p of x greater than or equal to 4.8945 just equals the integral of the chi-squared distribution from 4.8945 all the way up to infinity. And this comes out to be about 0.4289. Such a moderate p-value that's neither too close to zero nor one 
suggests that this value of our chi-squared test statistic is neither too large, suggesting significant deviation between the model and the observed data, nor cl too close to small, suggesting a model that fits the data even with its inherent variability improbably well. Therefore, the goodness of fit test suggests that the theoretical binomial distribution explains the observed data reasonably well. The fit is genuinely good. Our next technique, normal correlation analysis for linear regression models, addresses the question of how appropriate is it to train a regression model on a particular data set. In previous videos, we introduced simple linear regression and the coefficient of determination largely through a series of two modeling examples. The coefficient of determination formed a measure that we employed as a rule of thumb for evaluating the ability of the regression model to describe the variation seen in a bivariate data set. Presently, we will outline an alternative approach that is more grounded in hypothesis testing. The theoretical foundation for this approach is somewhat deep, so we will intentionally limit our rigor in order to more quickly reach the point where we can state and use a hypothesis test for deciding if our model supports the idea that bivariate data is linearly correlated or not. The approach in question is known as normal correlation analysis. The general steps that lead up to it are as follows. Suppose D equals xi comma yi with i ranging from 1 to 2 to 3 on up through n is a set of coordinate pairs that we take to be randomly sampled from a bivariate normal population with parameters mu of x and mu of y representing the means of x and y, sigma x and sigma y representing the standard deviations of x and y, and rho representing the correlation coefficient for x and y. We have not yet introduced a bivariate normal distribution and we'll explore the meaning of its correlation coefficient parameter later. But briefly, the distribution is described by the following probability density function. N of mu of x, mu of y, sigma x, sigma y, rho, and x and y. It's equal to the exponential function applied to negative one over two times one minus rho squared all times the quantity x minus the mean of x over sigma x squared minus 2 rho times x minus mean of x over sigma x times y minus mean of y over sigma y plus y minus mean of y over sigma y squared. All of that, including the exponential, is divided by 2 pi times sigma x times sigma y times the root of 1 minus rho squared. Here, the means of x and y can range over any real number, and sigma x and sigma y can range over all strictly positive numbers, while rho, the correlation coefficient, must be constrained between negative 1 and 1. It turns out that the correlation coefficient rho and the coefficient of determination capital R squared are related through the identity R squared equals rho squared. That is, rho is the signed square root of R squared. If rho approaches positive 1 for a particular data set, that's indicative that the data set has a strong positive linear correlation, clusters closely to a line with positive slope. If, on the other hand, rho approaches negative 1, that, that, that's an indication that there's a strong negative correlation where the data clusters around a line with negative slope. And then finally, as rho takes on values close to 0, that's an indication that there isn't much of a linear correlation at all between the x and y coordinates in the data set. The data shouldn't be modeled with a linear model, in other words. Next, we'll form the likelihood function for our data set D. We do this by applying the bivariate normal distribution to each coordinate pair in our data set, and then forming the product of those results. We'll then apply maximum likelihood estimation to this likelihood function in order to estimate the parameters mu sub x, mu sub y, sigma sub x, sigma sub y, 
in a row. This turns out to be quite a process, but it's possible to derive exact formulas for the maximum likelihood estimators for these parameters. These are mu sub x star is equal to the mean of the x values in the data set, mu sub y star is equal to the sample mean of the y values in the data set, sigma x star and sigma y star are going to be equal to the sample standard deviations of the x and y values in the data set. And then rho star takes on the following form. It's the sum of the deviation of each x value from its mean times each y value deviation from its mean divided by the root of the sum of the squares of the deviations of each x value from their mean times the root of the sum of the squares of the deviations of each y value from their means. The maximum likelihood estimator rho star is called the sample correlation coefficient. By convention, we'll denote it by the variable r instead, lowercase r. It turns out that if rho equals zero, the bivariate normal distribution describes data in which the random variables x and y are completely uncorrelated. That is, their relationship cannot be described by a linear model at all. If, on the other hand, rho is allowed to approach plus or minus one, then x and y approach a state in which their behavior can be modeled perfectly by a linear relationship with positive or negative slopes respectively. These statements are by no means obvious. However, if we accept them, we can gain some insight into two things. First, rho and its estimator r can be used as measures of how well the variation in a data set can be described with a linear model. As rho and r approach one in magnitude, we can expect that a linear model does an increasingly better job of capturing the variation in the data set. Second, we can anticipate how little r and capital R squared might be related. That is, what's the relationship between the sample correlation co coefficient and the co coefficient of determination? If we let script r represent the random variable representing measurements of lowercase r, the sample correlation coefficient from data such as d, we might hope to determine a sampling distribution for script r. It turns out that finding such a sampling distribution is a very difficult prospect. However, it is possible to show that the statistic zeta equals one half times the log of one plus script r divided by one minus script r can be shown to have an approximately normal distribution with mean mu sub zeta equals one half the log of one plus rho divided by one minus rho, and a standard deviation of mu sub zeta of square root of one over n minus three. Therefore, if the size of the sample is sufficiently large, z equals one half log of one plus r over one minus r minus one half log of one plus rho over one minus rho divided by the one over the root of n minus three which can be simplified to be to say the root of n minus three over two times the log of one plus r times one minus rho divided by one minus r times one plus rho can be described with a standard normal distribution that may be used for testing whether or not rho is significantly different from a given value for a population of data that a sample d is taken from. Now this is a complex sounding process to be sure, and none of it should be obviously true. But if we recognize that we now have a statistic, script r, that appears in another statistic, zeta, for which we have a sampling distribution, the standard normal distribution, then we're well situated to compute that aggregate statistic of, of zeta from a data set and determine if it is behaving as we expect it to for particular values of rho. We'll illustrate that with an example. 
Recall that in an earlier example on regression, we presented a data set that summarized the annual salary and years in service for a sample of employees. The data set consists of just two columns of numerical observations, the years of experience for various employees and their annual salaries. An excerpt appears below for convenience. We found the following linear model for this data y equals w sub 0 plus w1 times x, where w sub 0 had a value of 25,792.2, and w1 had a value of 9,449.96. x represented the years in service for a given employee, and y represented the corresponding annual salary. In a follow-up example, we evaluated that model by computing the coefficient of determination to find that r squared was equal to 0.9570. This value was reasonably close to 1, so we concluded that the model fit our data well. However, we really shouldn't be satisfied with that conclusion alone. We should be interested in answering some version of the question, how well can we expect this model to fit other samples of data of the same size drawn from the same population? One partial answer to that question can be had through hypothesis testing. A bad situation we'd like to avoid would be to derive a model that tells us that we would expect that our data could be described by a bivariate normal distribution with rho equals zero as a correlation coefficient. If that were the case, then we would expect that our data is uncorrelated and cannot be described by a linear model. Therefore, we would state the following null hypothesis. H sub 0, our sample is drawn from a bivariate normal distribution with rho equals 0. The z statistic for our data becomes z equals the square root of n minus 3 over 2 times the natural log of 1 plus r over 1 minus r since we are taking rho equals zero for the null hypothesis. Therefore, we need to compute the sample correlation coefficient r from our data. Recalling the equivalence of rho star and r, we can calculate r equals 0 0.97824. Of course, we could have also computed this simply by finding the square root of r squared and retaining the positive sign because our data appeared to be positively correlated. But the direct approach requires fewer assumptions about our data. In any case, now that we know R, we may compute the associated Z statistic using the formula above. And this would produce the result Z is approximately equal to 11.717. Finally, we ask the question, given the assumption that H sub 0 is true, how likely is it that we would expect to collect a similarly sized sample from our population that produces a sample correlation coefficient at least as extreme as the one that we found? The answer would be P of Z greater than or equal to 11.717 equals the integral of the standard normal distribution from Z equals 11.717 up through infinity. This comes out to a value of 5.2008 times 10 to the negative 32. This is a very low probability, therefore we can conclude that the sample of data we've obtained is significantly different from other samples of a similar size drawn from an uncorrelated population. The apparent linear correlation present in our data is unlikely to be due from random chance. Therefore, in some sense, we can be fairly confident that our model would continue to perform well for other similarly sized samples randomly selected from the population ours came from. Now that we've explored the process of testing a regression model against a hypothesis of non-correlated data through an example, we can conclude by formally stating the test we used as a theorem. Suppose d equals xi and yi for i ranging from 1 through n is a set of coordinate pairs that we take to be randomly sampled from a bivariate normal population with parameters mu sub x, mu sub y, sigma sub x, sigma sub y, and rho. Further, suppose that we've built a linear regression model for this data and have computed the sample correlation coefficient r from d. 
then the statistic z equals the root of n minus 3 over 2 times the natural log of 1 plus r divided by 1 minus r has a standard normal sampling distribution which can be used to test the following null hypothesis, h sub 0. The sample is drawn from a bivariate normal distribution with a theoretical correlation coefficient rho equals 0. So this theorem provides the framework that we can use for testing the degree to which bivariate data has a correlation significantly far off from rho equals zero. That brings us to the end of this video lesson. I hope you found it helpful and that you'll be able to join us for our next video lesson. Our next video will be a technological companion for this video lesson that demonstrates how to reproduce the examples we've seen here using MATLAB.